Hi everybody and welcome back to lecture. Greetings from my office this time. Um, here in week five we're going to turn our attention to life in prison as I promised you guys last week. So um, between those individuals who are incarcerated in both jails and prisons we're really talking about two plus million individuals um, and that puts the United States at sort of number one in the entire world. We have the largest incarceration population across all different countries. Um, and when we're talking about incarceration, as I said, we have these two plus million people who are currently incarcerated. And eventually the majority, if not um, almost all of those individuals are going to get out at some point in time and they're going to join the other five million plus individuals who are currently on some sort of supervision still whether that's parole or um, probation of some kind or maybe these individuals are working their way out in a halfway house whatever it may be um, in total we have seven plus million individuals who are in some sort of supervision with the state or with the federal um, government in that regard. So when we're talking about this massive, massive group of people, um, one of the things that we cannot forget to talk about is the idea of race. And within that large um, offender population at either the incarcerated level or the community supervision level, um, one of the things that we have to acknowledge is that um, the majority of these individuals are minority. So we have a, a lot more African American and Hispanic individuals who are currently incarcerated compared to their white counterparts. And we know from a lot of the academic research and literature out there, um, we know that minority individuals often are experiencing um, disproportionate contact with all parts of the criminal justice system. So whether it's out on the streets with law enforcement, um, they're having a light, higher likelihood of conviction, they're receiving longer prison sentences if they are incarcerated, and all of this is in comparison to white individuals. So we just know across the board that minority um, offenders and defendants are having um, more prolonged contact and experiences within the criminal justice system compared to white offenders. In particular, um, let's talk for a minute about black men. When we're talking about black men and incarceration, we're seeing um, at this point in time about one in three black men will experience incarceration at some point in their life. So 33% of all black men will be incarcerated at some point, whether that's for a short duration or for a very long extended period of time. Um, incarceration is incarceration, so they're going for you know, they're going at much higher rates than white individuals. Um, when we're talking about black females, conditions are slightly better. We're seeing a ratio of about one in nine black women are going to be incarcerated at some point in their life. Um, but still, that's a bit higher than the one in three ratio we see for black men. So to just sort of put this a little bit in perspective, 33% of fathers, sons, um, brothers, friends are being removed from communities to become incarcerated. And when we talk about <coughs> incarceration among black men, we're really talking about young black men. Um, they're, these, black, these young men um, are normally between tw the ages of 20 and 34, and they're missing some of the most formative and important years of their children's lives, of their own lives. If you're being incarcerated at 20, you're considered a young adult, but you're not really considered a fully developed adult. Um, one of the things that we'll talk about next week when we get to juvenile offenders is, and I may have already mentioned this at one point in time in the semester, our brains don't fully develop until we're 25 years old. So even though legally I'm adult, an adult, I'm not a fully formed adult. So at 20 years old, I'm being removed from my community and I'm going away and I'm being incarcerated for a significant amount of time. That's pretty crazy to me that that high of a proportion of individuals are being incarcerated. And I know then the counter argument is often, well, if you don't want to go to prison, then you shouldn't commit the crime. And I understand that to an extent. Um, but let's sit down and think, break this down a little bit more there has to be a reason why black men are being incarcerated five times more often than white men, right? There's 
no sound argument out there that says, well, black men are just inherently more criminal than white men. That's the reason why. They're committing more crimes. Um, they are just more likely to engage in illegal activity compared to white men. There's no sound scientific research out there that is going to support this fact. And instead, what we're seeing is um, a system, really, at multiple stages, at multiple levels, and we're seeing a system that is in, is working inherently against minorities of all, all, all minorities, not just black individuals, but all minor, minorities at sort of every step of the line. And um, in your readings this week, the Schneider article does a really good job of talking about this disproportionate contact that I was mentioning before that minorities are experiencing with law enforcement in particular. So black men are more likely to experience stop and frisk searches. They're more likely to come from low income neighborhoods where there's just generally a higher police presence. They're more likely to be arrested during traffic stops. So they're no more likely to be stopped than white individuals. But once that traffic stop happens, um, once they are pulled over by the police, they're significantly more likely to be arrested compared to white drivers. So we're seeing something happening. If white and black drivers are being pulled over at the exact same rate for a traffic infraction, a busted taillight, I ran a stop sign, whatever it is, right? If they're being pulled over at similar, if not same rates, then why are black men being arrested a lot more often than white men? or black women are being arrested a lot more often than white women. What is going on? <coughs> Excuse me. So not only is it this disproportionate contact, um, that's occurring, but once the arrest is made, they're heading to the court system. And we're also seeing disproportionate sentences being handed down once we're in the court system. So then our conversation turns to the idea of the sentencing policies that we've previously discussed in this class um, and sort of the negative impact that these sentencing policies have had directly on minority defendants compared to white defendants. So the policies regarding the war on drugs have seemingly targeted drug users when they were meant to go after drug traffickers. Um, but if you look at the types of drugs that have been targeted, largely these are drugs that are used by minority offend or defendants more so than white defendants. So the glaring, glaring thing that comes to mind is the idea of the sentencing ratio between crack and powder cocaine. Um, some of you may be familiar with this. We'll talk about it more in detail when we get to the, the war on drugs um, week. But the idea that 100 grams of, um, <coughs> excuse me, 100 grams of powder cocaine is equivalent to one gram of crack cocaine. So you could have a boatload of powder and be sentenced for the exact same amount of time as you would be for one gram of crack cocaine. Um, so a lot harder of a, of a stance against one form of the drug compared to the other, even though pharmacologically they're just about the exact same. So many of, turning back to that Schneider piece that I mentioned before, many of the tough on crime policies that are mentioned in that piece have really had a significant contribution to the idea of rising minority incarceration. Um, and even when we talk about things that try to divert offenders or defendants really out of the um, correctional system. So when we talk about um, specialized courts, diversionary programs, things like that, we're often seeing that white defendants are being pushed through these diversionary type programs compared to minority offenders. Um, and the other thing um, that I want to sort of talk about um, is this idea that fits in with the idea of disproportionate contact. Um, is the com community impact that incarceration has. So for many communities, as you're having just almost, we could, we could say, generations of individuals who are being removed from these communities, it's having an impact on the neighborhoods that they are leaving behind. And it's not that same sort of impact that we're seeing in white neighborhoods. So for example, in low-income minor minority um, 
neighborhoods, there's sort of a tendency for individuals to be selling drugs in more of an open air environment. Um, so maybe I will go buy drugs from my friend on the street corner rather than buying drugs from my friend in the living room of his house. So visibility is a lot more transparent. A police officer could be driving by and could see the drug exchange happening right here on the street corner. And remember, in these same neighborhoods, we're seeing a stronger police presence than we are in higher income neighborhoods. So the police are out and about more, they're patrolling more, they're they're able to see and catch offenders a lot more often than they are in high income neighborhoods where the tendency is to go buy your drugs inside a house, for example. Um, so the visibility alone leads to an increase in the arrest of minority individuals compared to arrest for white individuals. So the idea of disproportionate contact in the criminal justice system as a whole is a prevalent sort of thing for minority offenders in, in particular. Um, and when they go to prison, they're often experiencing longer pr prison sentences than white individuals. And once they're there, um, prisons sort of become this very... I guess it's, it's sort of a very interesting dynamic in terms of race when you get inside a prison because very quickly what you're seeing is this racial divide sort of happening and you're seeing more self-segregation than you are institutional segregation. So it's not necessarily that the correctional officers are housing all of the black inmates here and all of the white inmates here and then the Hispanic inmates are down here and the Asian inmates are over here. Um, we're seeing a lot of self-segregation. So even though you might be housed in your cell with a cellmate of a different race, as soon as you're out of that cell, there is a lot of self-segregation in terms of who you are associating with, um, and that's done for a reason. And again, that's not necessarily because the correctional officers are mandating it. It's because of the inmates themselves. Um, so this could be based on gang affiliation, because prison gangs are largely based on, on these racial sort of identifications, um, or it could just be out of loyalty to members of your own race. Um, there's not a whole lot of interaction that's taking place across racial lines. And sometimes this is done purely out of safety reasons. If my fellow white inmates see me interacting and spending time with black inmates, they might see me as a traitor. The black inmates might see me as being or might view me in a suspicious way. Um, you know, all the other white inmates are over here, but this guy or this lady's over here talking to us. What's going on? Is this person a mole? Is this person trying to find something out to use it against us later? Um, there's just this high level of distrust and paranoia that's sort of circulating these environments, um, especially when it comes to race and different interactions between people of the same or different races. Um, prison race, prison gangs, though, excuse me, um, are largely based on affiliate, racial affiliation, and we often see different gangs being at war with one another. But sometimes there's these odd sort of allied networks that are taking place as well. So, for example, um, we, we see a lot of white gangs that are just inherently always at war with black prison gangs. Um, but then there might be some sympathy that exists between the white gangs and the Hispanic gangs or the Hispanic gangs and the black gangs. But then it only takes one minute before something happens and then everybody's at war with each other once more. Um, but when things are sort of at a stalemate or nothing's really happening, which is not too often, um, but when you do have those peaceful moments, you sort of still see everybody keeping to themselves within their own gang affiliations. The other thing that we know to be true about prison gangs is the sort of very highly specialized and interconnect interconnected networks that they seem to have within the prison community and with um, between prison networks and then within the regular lay community as well. So often there is a hierarchical structure within prison gangs and you have a small time prison gang leader within this specific facility and I'm only in charge of what's happening here. But I'm in constant contact with the higher ups who are living in the community or who might be living in supermax prisons, um, you know, I'm never an isolated type of leader. There's always someone else who is higher up who's running things either from the outside or who's running things from a more secure facility somewhere. 
But the way in which these individuals communicate is very interesting because they develop these very highly specialized secretive types of codes that the correctional officers often have difficulties trying to interpret or break down um, or, or sort of figuring out what these messages mean because they're so coded. So I might be able to write back and forth or I could have um, some sort of correspondence with a family member on the outside, but the letter that I'm writing is all within the prison gang code and once on the outside then that person who's also familiar with the secret language that we're writing in will know the directions that I'm sending him or her or maybe I have questions about the next step that I'm supposed to take or who am I supposed to attack those types of things it's all written in the regular letter that I'm sending out there um, or maybe I get new information that comes through um, visitation days. My wife, my child, my brother, whoever it is, might come visit me and they might give me the next piece of information that I have. Um, but don't fear, like these, these individuals are really talking to each other um, on a very frequent type of level. So everybody always knows what the other gang members are doing here. And because these are so interconnected and because they're often so large and so pervasive within the correctional system as a whole, um, we just tend to see a ton of gang-related activities happening at every, every different level of the correctional system. So whether it might be... Um, you know, an attack on a rival gang member, maybe it's bringing in contraband from the outside into the prison, um, and contraband can really be anything because there's such a black market within the prisons itself, so it could be drugs, it could be a certain type of food, it could be um, chewing tobacco, whatever it may be, There's if there's a desire for it, we can get it inside this prison. Um, and the gangs run all of that. But as an inmate, you have to make a choice as to whether or not you're going to take your chances being a gang member or take your chances not being a gang member. And, you know, there's a necessary evil to both of those choices. But if you do decide that you're going to become a gang member, there's lots of hoops that you have to jump through to sort of become initiated. Um, and they sort of run by this code. I don't know if any of you have heard it before, but there's the idea of blood in, blood out. So you have to do something to prove yourself to the gang to get in. That might be an assault, that might be a murder, something like that. And the only way to get out is to either kill someone else who's higher ranking, potentially kill yourself, give yourself up to correctional officers so they can put you in protective custody. Um, but the idea of blood out is a lot harder than the idea of blood to get in. Um, and once you are in the prison gang, it's all about unity and it's all about identification. And one of the best ways that prison gangs can identify themselves, specifically members, to one another is through the, the specialized use of prison tattoos. And prison tattoos are just, to me at least, are so very interesting because talk about the idea of necessity is the mother of invention right? So you're in a prison and you don't have a tattoo gun, but all of these inmates are coming out with a lot of prison tattoos and you can do a whole lot with a sewing needle and a big pen. Um, and you can see largely, you, you know, a person has been to prison if they have a lack of color in their tattoos. Um, most prison tattoos are just solid black or solid blue, largely black because that's, that's the ink they can get their hands on. Um, but somebody who has a lot of tattoos that are not necessarily the best looking, but are normally just all black with some shading. That normally indicates that that person has a potential to to have gotten those tattoos while in prison. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, back to the idea of prison gangs and tattoos. So everything has a certain meaning within different gangs. Um, and if you want to look up all the different prison gangs that are out there and their tattoos, feel free. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to talk about, because I think these are probably the most visual or that you could you could probably connect with a gang is the, the idea of the messages and symbols that are hidden within, um, <clears throat> excuse me, within the tattoos of the Aryan Brotherhood or the Aryan Nation. Excuse me, my voice is getting a little little done there. Um, so as you can imagine from the name Aryan Brotherhood, um, it has a very Germanic sounding name. Um, so it's going to be pro-white 
anti-minority, anti-Jew, anti-Catholic, all of those sort of things that the Nazi party stood for, we're seeing out here with white supremacist um, gang members who are part of the Aryan Brotherhood. Um, within the tattoos that the Aryan Brotherhood uses, you can imagine that there is the classic Nazi swastika, and that swastika is pervasive through a lot of their different tattoos, whether it's the swastika on its own, or it could be the swastika that is embedded within some other sort of symbol or design, but it's a very per pervasive element as part of the Aryan Brotherhood. Um, one of the other things that might be an identifying factor for an Aryan Brotherhood member is the number 12. So if you see anybody who has the number 12 tattooed on them, um, this could be a potential gang member. So the number 1 could be substituted out for the letter A, and the number 2 could be substituted out for the letter B. AB stands for the Aryan Brotherhood. Um, but the most common symbol for the Aryan Brotherhood, like, symbol, logo, um, sort of a crest, if you will. Um, normally it's going to be a shamrock with a um, swastika sort of designed in front of it. Um, another common tattoo that they might have are two lightning bolts sort of shaped like S's. And this is another World War II Nazi symbol. Um, the symbol of the two lightning bolts looked like that look like S's are the symbol of the SS, which was one of the wings of the Nazi party that Heinrich Himmler led. And this was supposed to be, or originated to be, um, uh, Hitler's personal bodyguard unit. So the SS was known for being very brutal, take no prisoners, we'd shoot you um, more likely than ash actually ask you questions because our job is to protect the Fuhrer kind of idea. So the SS became a very feared unit within the Nazi party and quickly that the, uh, the symbol for the SS translated into gangs as well. Um, but there's all sorts of different symbols that are used throughout many white prison gangs, um, Hispanic pres prison gangs, and black prison gangs as well. Um, it depends on who you're with, the state you're, you're located in, your different affiliations. Um, but a lot of these gangs will use tattoos as a way to communicate and identify as a member of this particular gang. <coughs> Okay, so the idea of gang membership, like I said, it's sort of this catch-22. Do I want to be part of the gang? Do I want to not be part of the gang and risk that? Um, but as a member of the gang, I might join the gang as a way to further victimize other inmates, or p potentially I could use my gang membership as a method of protection. If I'm in the gang, there's a high level of loyalty associated with that, and if anything were to happen from another inmate or I would be attacked, my gang members would sort of um, retaliate on my behalf. So you could almost sort of think of it as inmates who might have a higher risk of victimization themselves. They can join the prison gang. And I mean, it's difficult to do. You have to gain their trust and do things to get inside of the gang. Um, but if you can get in, you could sort of find protection from those individuals who are perceived to run the institution or have some sort of power within the institution itself. Um, but really what this comes down to is the idea of a coping mechanism, right? I use my gang affiliation as protection. It's my way to get through my incarceration experience. It's my method of coping. And coping me mechanisms within prison take all sorts of shapes and forms. And it doesn't have to be something as extreme as just joining a prison gang. It could be something as simple and everyday as the idea of humor. And humor is one of those things that it, it's part of the readings for this week as well, but humor doesn't necessarily have to be light humor. Um, within the incarceration setting, the, um, the reading this week focused on humor talks about the idea of dark or black hum humor as well. So anything you can do to sort of inject a level of brushing off the severity of the situation, injecting some sort of um, levity into the situation, making light of what you're going through, all of these things, and even if it's in a dark, sarcastic way, um, it's a coping mechanism, right? I can make things a little bit more bearable for myself within this situation. I don't necessarily control when I take a shower, when I get to eat, um, when I talk to my loved ones, when I get to visit with my loved ones. I don't get to control when I go to sleep, all of these different things. Um, 
all of that is out of my control. But I can take charge of how I feel about the situation. I can take charge of how I'm going to choose to interact with other inmates. And for some, this might be the idea of humor. Um, and we see this in our everyday lives. We might know that person who makes jokes at a funeral or tries to make light of a breakup, right? If I do that, I can get things back within my own control and I can make things a little bit more bearable, a little bit more easier for myself. And the same sort of concept goes towards incarceration. Um, if I can make light of the situation, it's not as bad as I perceive it to be in the general setting of my everyday life. So regardless, life in prison is not very easy, um, and there's a number of things that these inmates have to contend with every week, or every every day of their prison experience. Um, next week, what we're going to do is change directions just a little bit, and we're going to focus on juvenile offenders. And juvenile offenders are a very special, unique population because they are underage. But depending on the age in which they commit their crime and the severity of the offense, they have the p potential to be treated as an adult. But there are still special protections that prison facilities in particular have to implement to protect the special nature that comes with being underage. So regardless of whether or not you are housed in a juvenile detention facility or potentially an adult jail or prison, um, juveniles are just inherently different. So next week, what we're going to do is turn our attention to life in life incarcerated as a juvenile offender. We're going to look at the idea of development. We're going to look at the idea of sight and sound separation within adult facilities. We're going to look at juvenile detention and how um, committing an offense as a juvenile has a potential impact on the rest of your life as an adult. So thank you guys so much this week for your time and your attention. Um, as always, let me know if you have any questions or if you want to meet with me. And if not, then I will see you guys next week when we turn our attention to juvenile offenders. I'll see you then. Thanks and have a, have a great day, everybody. I'll see you later. Bye.